John, real pleasure to speak to you from Toronto to London. Thank you. For anyone who doesn't know, you've been putting out a series called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. For me, it's probably the most excited I've felt at a kind of intellectual journey since I discovered Jordan Peterson, I guess, a year and a half ago. And what's kind of amazing about it is that you guys work in the same department. Yeah, we're colleagues at the University of Toronto. Yeah. So what are, they put, what are they putting in the water at the University of Toronto? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, we just have a lot of really good people in that department. And there are some similarities between your work and his. You both talk about meaning a lot. You both talk about you're not afraid to kind of go into the mythological, into the religious. What would you say are the similarities and the differences between your work and his? Okay, so um, some of the important uh, similarities, uh, I, I think you put your finger on it very well. I think we're both concerned with the issue of meaning and the meaning crisis. Um, I, would, uh, I would claim, in fact, that I think a significant proportion of Jordan's popularity is that he's talking about uh, the meaning crisis, because I think it's exigent right now and perhaps even urgent. Um, and uh, we are interested in uh, the role of myth and ritual. Uh, Jordan is also, I believe, interested in altered states of consciousness. Um, so those are some of the significant uh, similarities, I would say. Uh, and so we've, we've shared a lot of students over the past years because of this. Uh, we've spoken at multiple conferences together because of, of these shared interests. Um, Jordan also has an interest, because uh, I had a public debate with him a few quite a while ago on what's called the frame problem, which relates to the work I do on relevance realization. So that, there's a shared interest there. Some of the main differences. Um, so Jordan's framework is very largely uh, from psychology personality theory and um, from psychodynamic background Jungian. Um, so I, I know Jung and I've got, I've, I went through Jungian therapy to get an inside understanding of it. I've taken workshops. Um, and and I, I, I do some relevant work around that, so I have some understanding of it. I don't have his expertise, um, but that, that is not the primary framework within which I work. The framework with, with, within which I work is very much a cognitive science framework. Um, so for your listeners who aren't familiar with it, cognitive science is an interdisciplinary uh, science. It's designed to get the various discourses that talk about the mind at various levels, like neuroscience, the brain, machine learning, information processing, psychology, behavior, linguistics, language, to get them all to talk to each other because they all use very different terminology, different methods, different, different types of evidence. So getting them all to talk to each other so we can get a better understanding of how these various different levels of the mind causally interact and constrain uh, each other and also th so we can get a more coherent and clear picture of mind rather than having these disparate disconnected discourses about the mind. So I do a lot of work uh, in cognitive science and I bring that framework uh, to bear and then in connection with that I have, uh, I have multiple degrees in philosophy so I also bring in a philosophical framework especially through uh, the Neoplatonic uh, tradition in the West and the Buddhist tradition uh, in the East. I also um, uh, I practice, uh, uh, there, there's Buddhist practices I engage in and I teach, Vipassana and Metta, and I also do Tai Chi Chuan and uh, Qigong, so I also have familiarity with Taoism. So I have that as sort of a, a different background uh, than Jordan. I also, um, I, I have a different take on certain aspects, so areas where I think I would be um, in disagreement with Jordan is, uh, Jordan tends to uh, pitch this um, a, as a political issue, as a uh, confrontation from ideologies. I have sort of principled arguments against seeing it that way uh, and trying to frame the meaning crisis that way. So that's one area where I probably would significantly uh, disagree with him on how to try to respond to the meaning crisis. That's a really, lots of really interesting things to pick up on there already. Um, I mean, this is something that we try to do with Rebel Wisdom is to bring more of a kind of what is the meta crisis that is generating the political crisis rather than what is the political crisis per se because then you just get dragged into these very polarized debates very quickly. I just want to sort of back up a little bit and just ask you what is the meaning crisis? The symptoms are things we're talking about. We've got you know incredible political adversarial and degenerative discourse uh, we have the pervasive uh, sense, we talked about this, Chris, and 
Philip and I in the book, uh, 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 we actually measured it, right? Um, of, uh, of a sense of increasing bullshit in the society. Now, I use that term technically, and we might want to talk about that at some point, uh, following on Frankfurt's seminal work on bullshit. But the, 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 the pervasive sense uh, that uh, bullshit is growing and becoming permeating our society in greater, de uh, in, in greater uh, uh, both detail and scope, and um, the increasing, th this weird dichotomy where everything is politicized, but people are being politically disenfranchised. They, the, the, you know, voting's going down, participation in parties is going down. You have uh, disenfranchisement from established religious institutions. You have a failing in faith in all, uh, in most of our political institutions, definitely the legislative, uh, increasingly judicial, law enforcement. Um, you have an increasing default uh, existential stance of nihilism and cynicism, uh, often very shallow versions of this, though, as pervasive through the culture. And this is also, uh, I, I would argue, and I think others would agree with this, exacerbating the mental health crisis, the addiction crisis, opioid crisis, things like that. And how long would you say that the meaning crisis has been in production, or how, how, how far back would you date it? <laughs> So <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a tricky question. I think that, so I talk about these three orders that help to uh, organize uh, the various ways in which, so when you study meaning in life, people are sort of, they're, they're trying to, they need a, a framework to help them make sense. They need a framework to help them connect to reality and connect to other people. And they need a, a framework that gives them a sense of how to improve normatively, uh, self-transcendence in some fashion. And of course, we had a framework with that. It was, it, was a, it was a grand synthesis, right, of sort of Christianity and Neoplatonism. And that framework has collapsed and, right, in the face of a very powerful, and I, 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 I would also add very important, I am a scientist, the scientific framework. And so I think when we can start the dating of the meaning crisis uh, and about the 12th century, believe it or not, because that's when you see that framework start to unraveling. Uh, start to unravel, and then that unraveling accelerates um, through time. The scientific revolution, the Protestant Reformation have a huge accelerating effect. The Industrial Revolution has a huge accelerating effect. And now, of course, the computer revolution, right, and the AI revolution are having accelerating effects, social media. So it, it, it starts, uh, I would say, like in the 12th century, but it's accelerating. It's being massively accelerating, I think, especially in the last 20 years. And just sort of going back to, to Jordan Peterson a little bit, I think we spoke before, we had a, we had a, a, a Zoom call a few days ago, and you, you kind of joked that Jordan Peterson was a gateway drug to your thinking. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I want it clear that, you know, um, Jordan has been very supportive of my work, and so I don't want to in any way come off as dismissive or, or, uh, of him. Um, uh, Jordan is a very complex a uh, guy, a very complex thinker. Uh, but what has typically happened, at least in my anecdotal experience, is people get interested in, in, in Jordan's work. I have to be careful here. There's a selection bias. I'm only getting a certain, certain set. But typically people have come out of, you know, a religious framework or an atheist framework. They've gotten introduced to Jordan's discussions about spirituality and religion and mythology and the unconscious. And then they come because they typically want something, as I've mentioned earlier, beyond a Jungian framework. They want a way of um, incorporating that in two senses that I don't think Jordan talks about that I, uh, I, I can. Namely, that whole cognitive scientific framework. How do we bring our best cutting edge cognitive science to bear on these issues so that we can integrate this understanding of spirituality with the scientific framework. That's extremely important to me, by the way. This integration, like, like I, I talked about how cognitive science integrates across the disciplines. It's very important to me that I integrate. Right? I respect the differences, but yet build a bridging vocabulary between, what, for lack of a better term, spirituality and the scientific worldview. And so th th that's one reason why they come to me. The other reason is, I mean, I, I teach you know, Vipassana meditation, Metta, Tai Chi Chuan. I teach, you know, I've taught uh, with, you know, when I had a wisdom sangha, various, you know, uh, stoic practices and psychotechnology. So people also come uh, to get, you know, well, how, what do I actually train? How do I practice uh, transforming consciousness, cognition, character? So that's how, that's how that happens.
So I've heard you talk about cognitive science quite a lot, and I wasn't familiar with the term before. And I have to say, it sounds like quite a boring term for something that, when you talk about it, sounds absolutely fascinating. And, and what I understand by it, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's, and much of your work is about how we do things. So it, it's the, how, we, how we think rather than what we think and the content of what we think. And actually, yeah. it turns out that how we think is at least as important, if not more important, than what we're thinking. That is a very astute way of putting it. I really want to emphasize the process of how we make meaning as opposed to what the, you know, that meaning uh, is, its structures and things like that. I want to understand the how. And I think this is directly relevant, uh, for example, in one important way to the meaning crisis, because knowledge is about what we know, but wisdom is much more about how we know. Right? And, and so studying this how we know and how we make things relevant and how we form these connections and how we right, make this obvious salience landscaping so that my actions and my thinking seem just directly and intuitively appropriate to the circumstances. That's exactly what I want to know. And that's all relevant to wisdom. We've ha certainly had the sense since we started uh, putting films out there that there's a real kind of intellectual awakening going on, probably facilitated by the internet. And yeah. I guess since you've been putting out your, your films as well, you've got a sense that you, you've kind of started tapping into that as well. Yeah. What, what, what do you make of that? What do you make of the kind of the, the sense that there is something happening? So I find that very encouraging. I mean, I think part of the reason is, like I said, there, I, I do think I have arguments and evidence, and, and, and this is in self uh, kind of evidence that there is a meaning crisis. People are definitely searching and looking. And there's also, I think, clear frustration with uh, uh, many of the answers that are on offer in the popular culture, the political arena, um, even in sort of uh, the established religions. I, I want to be clear that I think there are people within the religious framework, like Jonathan Pajot and Paul Vanderclay, who are trying to, uh, I think, I think they need to uh, take more credit for what they're trying to do. I think they're trying to do a very serious philosophical overhaul uh, uh, of Christianity to try and address this uh, emerging uh, crisis. So there's other people doing all of this work. So that, so uh, some of the factors, there is a meaning crisis, there's the frustration with sort of traditional, established, political, and even religious uh, responses. Uh, there's already people out there who are doing this co convergent work, both within cognitive science, and like I mentioned, Jonathan and Paul, doing the, this philosophical uh, 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 restructuring or reframing of Christianity to address this crisis. So, um, I, I, I t I, I'm much more hopeful uh, about things now because, sorry, every academic thinks too highly of their own work, so I'm trying to be, to be careful here. Um, but I do think it's plausible to assert that there is also a looming sense of crisis in general um, in our culture. Um, various interactions between, you know, socioeconomic issues, um, existential issues, political issues and ecological issues. And I think that's also driving this, a sense of urgency. And perhaps this sort of sense that there's a meta crisis that all of these other crises are actually a function of some kind of generator function. The connection I think that you're pointing to, I think is clear. I'm not sure what the order of causation is. I mean, I'm a scientist, so I worry about that. I would say this, I think I could say this without uh, being incautious. The meaning crisis exacerbates and interacts with these other crisis, crises in important ways. I'm not sure what, what's meta and what's not, so I'm, I, I'm, I, 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 but I get your point, and I think looking for the interaction in that way is also something that I'm pursuing in the video series and in my work. Trying to get a sense of, you know, how does this cognitive cultural crisis interact with these other crises, and, and you know, what are the lines of mutual reinforcement to use some of the language we were talking about earlier, how is all of this self-organizing and self-perpetuating? Because until we understand that, we're going to have a very, a very difficult time intervening. You see, the problem with self-organizing systems, think of your body, it's an adaptive system, it's highly self-organizing. If it's perturbed, if something tries to destroy it, part of what that self-organizing does is restructure itself to, to, to adapt. You get a pathogen and your immune system kicks in. You, there's a change in your environment and your brain learns. So self-organizing systems can restructure themselves to adapt 
to attempts to destroy them. And if we don't understand the self-organizing, the dynamics of the interaction of all these crises, our attempts to intervene, our one-shot attempts here and here and here, I predict are going to constantly keep failing because the self-organizing process is going to adapt and preserve itself. And this, this kind of intellectual awakening that I've talked about a couple of times, yeah. I think there's, there's quite a few people who have a sense that this conversation, there is an evolving conversation that is kind of headed somewhere. And I think the sense of where people think, feel that it's headed to is, a, is an integration of the spiritual traditions, of the religious traditions in a meaningful way after the sort of the, the overthrow of the kind of new atheist hegemony. Now there is a sense of, again, rather than kind of writing off all of these things as just sort of superstitions and things we've evolved past, a, the potential for an integration of the world's wisdom traditions. Yes, I, I, I would agree. That's it, that is exactly uh, how I would put it and what my sense of it is as well. Um, so... I think what's happening is this integration, and both sides are changing, right? So the way we're doing cognitive science in third generation, this is the science side, the way we're doing cognitive science in third generation cog side is very different from how we're doing it in first generation, right? And so the science is changing and the spirituality is, they're, they're starting to change in this reciprocal manner. And so both are, are, are gonna have to give ground, by the way. I don't have a right term because the term I use, um, it sounds dismissive. Uh, I, I try to say I'm trying to salvage what I can from these axial age uh, wisdom, uh, 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 tech, uh, uh, wisdom traditions, these systematic sets of psychotechnologies for transforming, you know, uh, consciousness, cognition, character, and community. Like those are powerful. Um, we have to salvage those. And my reason for saying that is because they 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 were born from and are enmeshed in. Uh, the Axial Revolution and its, and its two-world mythology and, and all kinds of ways of trying to give us a grammar for thinking about self-transcendence that do not mesh well, do not fit well with the scientific worldview. So, I, for example, I don't like nostalgic attempts to try and re-establish the two-world view, um, but neither uh, do, I, uh, do I countenance as, as you would say, this sort of the, the, the rejection of all of this as sort of superstition garbage. That, so I'm trying, I, I, I ask my students who are from religions regularly and reliably, do you find what I'm doing disrespectful? And they say, no, you're being very respectful. And, and what you're doing is valuable to, to me. Uh, uh, and I think the, the fact that people like Jonathan and Paul find my work valuable is also sort of support for, for that point. But so try and not get the wrong connotations from this word, but I am trying to salvage from those wisdom traditions, right, what we, can, what we know and can learn about this meaning-making process, and more, more especially and importantly, how to engineer and create systematic sets of psychotechnologies that afford the transformation and the transcendence that people are longing for. That's what's very important. We talked a minute ago about this sort of sense of this conversation moving somewhere and that there is a kind of potentially an integration. I think that's what a lot of people feel excited by is this sense of that they, they can maybe not sense the destination, but they can certainly sense that there is a trajectory to it. Yeah. What do you think that integration looks like? This is what I, I argue, and this is what I'm going to argue in this series. There's going to be two components to it, right? We're going to have a historical scientific argument. That's why I spend half of the series on history and half of the, science, uh, the series on cognitive science, although they overlap in many ways, right? Uh, that is going to solve this problem, right? We have this wonderful scientific worldview and what we don't have is how we fit into that scientific worldview. We do not have a scientific explanation of how we generate scientific explanations. We do not have a scientific explanation of how we make the meaning systems that science presupposes when it pursues truth. Because you can't pursue truth if you don't have meaning. Right? So we don't have how we fit into that. We'll have an account of that. But that's the, and, and, and that account will hopefully 
stitch together all of those Cartesian divides, mind and body, mind and world, development and function that we were talking about earlier. But it will also help engineer sets of psychotechnologies that have to do with something completely other. So, no, not, not, not completely other. I misspoke. Something completely different. See, in addition to the historical forces that generate the meaning crisis, I would argue, there are perennial problems that beset us. The, 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 there are... Remember we talked about how the metacrisis is self-organizing and that, will, that actually make, thwarts our attempts to intervene? So in an analogous way, the, the, the complex self-organization that makes your cognition so adaptive also makes it perennially vulnerable to self-organizing complex processes of self-deception and self-destructive behavior. These are perennial problems. What I'm saying is perennially, because of right, the kind of cognition and consciousness you have, the very things that make the, the very factors that make your consciousness and your cognition adaptive make it perennially susceptible and vulnerable to powerful forms of self-deception and self-destructive behavior. And so we have always these problems and they can undermine our agency and undermine the meaning in our life in powerful and profound ways. We can find ourselves caught up in addiction. We can find ourselves beset by absurdities. We can find ourselves awash in despair. So many of the wisdom traditions have engineered psychotechnologies for addressing those perennial problems and also affording the cultivation of self-transcendence and wisdom so people can move to more optimal functioning. And what I think the solution will look like is from the spiritual traditions, we will get a lot of important tutoring, guidance, how to set up a culture, like Stephen Batcher talks about, a culture of awakening, how to set up systematic sets of psychotechnology. We will learn a lot of the psychoengineering of the systematic sets of psychotechnologies for addressing the perennial problems of despair and absurdity, self-deception, and affording the cultivation of wisdom and transcendence. And that will mesh with this new scientific worldview, which will deal with the historical development that has led us to where we are now. It will sew back up all these Cartesian divides and resituate us back into a worldview. And that's what I see coming together. What do you think is the key piece that you're bringing? Do you think it is the cognitive science piece? So I, I think for me, the key piece is the cognitive science in one sense, uh, uh, in that uh, it's helping me to uh, get an understanding of the meaning making and situate that into a, a, a scientific framework, uh, but also um, the cognitive science in the, its exemplification of a method of synoptic integration, this method of the learning sort of the ontology, the epistemology, the terminology, the methodology of different discourses and bridging between them. I think that's a very relevant skill that is needed to bridge between sort of the scientific worldview and uh, the, 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 the world in which we find meaning and, and meaningful action. And you mentioned before about the embodied brain. This is yeah. something that it seems, for, for quite a while I think um, there was a kind of Cartesian dualism or at least a kind of implicit Cartesian dualism. How much has that been broken down now in, in academia? Um, so one of the banner points of third generation COGSI is exactly the attempt to get rid of some of the, the, the I talk about it like uh, in terms of like this grammar, this, this theoretical cultural grammar of how to think about uh, the mind and its relationship to the body, the mind and its relationship to the world given to us by Descartes. Um, it's interesting because Descartes came up with all of these dichotomies to try and address the meaning crisis that was being generated by the advent of the scientific revolution. Uh, we should pay more attention, I think, uh, to, uh, to Spinoza because I think Spinoza gives a more comprehensive uh, response. Nevertheless, the old computational metaphor, right? Think about it. Your, the software and the hardware, okay? So your mind is the software and psychology studies that and your brain's the hardware and neuroscience studies that, right? And so everybody gets to keep their job. It's a great, it's a great framework. But when we move to this idea of cognition as inherently embodied in self-organizing, right? What happens is the, the divide between the software and the hardware breaks down. They become interpenetrating like in this idea of a bioeconomy constraining how your cognition, right, is 
uh, attending to information, right? And, and when, look, when a system is self-organizing, its function and its development are also now inseparable because it functions by developing and it develops by functioning. So you get development and function are now wedded together and they were separated before. And hardware and software are now wedded together and they were separated before. And how do emotions fit into this? Emotions are really important. Some of your viewers might know that one of, you know, one of the most important thinkers in the last 25 years about emotion, Ronnie D'Souza, is also at the University of Toronto. And you know, Ronnie's work was really important um, for making us understand uh, the, ra I mean, his book, his, his seminal book is The Rationality of Emotions. Um, uh, so, you know, really attacking that sort of decadent romantic uh, idea we have of this antithesis and antagonism between reason and emotion, and you have to choose one rather than the other, which is a very strange thing. We think of that as natural, and that's such a mistake, because if you go before uh, like the Romantic period. If you go back, for example, into Plato, uh, in the whole Neoplatonic tradition, love and reason are deeply interdefined and intermeshing. I mean, philosophia means the love of wisdom, right? A philosophy. Um, so what Ronnie helped to do was show how important um, emotions are to our rational agency. And then there's been a lot of work, like people like Damasio in his book, Descartes' Error, um, uh, uh, um, uh, Montague Reed's book, and your brain is almost perfect, talking about the fundamental difference between us and computers is we care, and we have to care about the information we're processing. It's precisely because you care that you can do, right, this, it, th this selecting what's obvious. So, like, you know, Damasio uh, studied people in Descartes' era where they're, they have a kind of brain damage, so the computational part of the brain is working great. They can do great, you know, puzzle solving and calculation and inferential stuff on an IQ test. But if you sort of did this with them, if you said, here's a red ink pen and here's a blue ink pen, which one do you want to write the test with? They'll go, ah, because they try to calculate all the possible permutations, right? Because their capacity to care, and, right? And, and to be moved. That's what emotions do for you. Uh, anger is just a powerful way in which your bioeconomy creates a salient landscape so that action and identities are obvious to you. Does it work perfectly? No, nothing can. We have to give up that Cartesian idea that there's something like a, a, a cognitively perfect form of cognition. But do um, our emotions absolutely central to your cognitive agency? Definitely. We should go, we should, we, we have to see reason and emotion as deeply interdependent and interdefining. And the, the idea of the embodied brain um, how, how widespread is that? How is this sort of, is what you're doing in cognitive science sort of cutting edge or is this sort of becoming the accepted wisdom? Somewhere between those two. Um, I think the ideas of embodied cognition, third generation cogsci are, I wouldn't say it's consensus in cognitive science, but definitely mainstream. Although some of the best cutting edge theoretical work is still being done there. Um, What's heartening to me, for example, is that these ideas um, that are becoming more prevalent in machine learning in one, in one sense and that are definitely becoming more prevalent in cognitive science and the philosophy of mind are now permeating into psychology. And what is the kind of real world impact of this cognitive science? It, does it suggest that we, that we should all be doing certain embodied practices if we want to kind of improve our cognition? What, what, what does it kind of, what's the real world um, relevance of it? Well, there's, there's two in very different directions. I mean, one, myself and Evan, for example, and other people, Francisco Varel, there, there is this growing confluence between third generation cog sci and traditional sets of psychotechnologies for altering consciousness and cognition, like Buddhism and Taoist practices. I even have a course at the University of a Toronto called Buddhism and Cog Sci, where I try and talk about and explore um, that, um, uh, that confluence. It was actually the progenitor to the video series in important ways, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to teach that course. Um, and so I think that's definitely the case. But the other thing, I think there's other, I think it's giving us a way, and, and this is also part of the real world impact, I think it's giving, and this really matters, it's giving people a new vocabulary for talking about uh, existential and spiritual meaning and transformation, 
that I, I think is really, really important. People need to be able to articulate their experience uh, to remove you know, confusion, equivocation, uh, to properly align cognitive processes for causal efficacy. All of this is afforded by this enriched and I think empowering vocabulary. And then the third thing is one that is going, it has been, and is going to increasingly make an impact on the meaning crisis, which is the advent of you know, autonomous artificial general intelligence, um, which is coming, that, that is definitely coming. And that's gonna make an impact on our existential self-understanding uh, greater, I will predict, than the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. In something we've noticed in the people that we've interviewed so far, the, the people that I've found that have been the most interesting, bringing forth the most kind of um, fascinating perspectives, often have a kind of either familiarity with or a, yeah, a relationship with what I might call the liminal space. Yes. There, there's some sense that they're able to tap into a sort of a space beyond themselves. Does that make any sense at all for a cognitive scientist? I, I, I think I do understand what you're saying uh, as a cognitive scientist and also as, as John Braveke. Um, because one of the things that I'm doing, not myself alone, other people, like I would point your, uh, your viewers to the really important work of L.A. Paul. She literally wrote the book on transformative experience called Transformative Experience. I mean, and, th and this is really, uh, you know, this is really tough, rigorous, but nevertheless beautifully written philosophy, right? Cognitive science. And I, I, I've had the pleasure to talk to Laurie uh, 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 and, and teach a uh, guest lecture in one of her classes. Um, and so um, more and more people, and this is what we do in the Consciousness and Wisdom Study Lab, my lab at the university, we're studying these transformative experiences where people are having things like mystical experiences, awakening experiences, and they have a sense of a deeper connectedness to a deeper level of reality. And I don't think that's a mistake. I'm sort of placing my cognitive scientific bet on the fact that, and I, I make arguments to this effect, and I, I, I talk about this, and, and this is what I'm publishing work on, that these higher states of consciousness really are important and constitutive of, you know, optimizing our cognition. Again, not in terms of what. See, the, the, the problem that we've had is that we've concentrated on the what that these, pro, these states give us. And I think that has been a fundamental mistake. Uh, I, I think it's inevitable that it happens because people have to talk about it, share it with others, and then that it gets enmeshed, right? And that's fine. But I think the how of these states the way they optimize our relevance realization, transform it, and, and enable something sort of analogous to the way you, what you see in child development, where children are sort of locked in schematic ways of thinking, and they make all of these systematic errors, and then they have you know, a Piagetian you know, change, and they go from one stage to another, and all of the, that system of illusions that they were prey to has fallen away. And I think you see the same kind of attempt to uh, become sensitive to and be able to intervene in systematic sets of illusion that beset sort of normal adult cognition and consciousness. And people through these transformative experiences get better in the how. They optimize better how to get a grip on reality, to connect to reality, and to get this sort of reciprocal realization. They are being opened up and reality are being opened up in a coupled reciprocal manner. And I think that is all something that cognitive science is, and we'll increasingly say more and more about. So are you saying that these kind of awakening experiences are part of our development? I don't want to sound like, I don't want to make it sound like an inevitable thing, right? I, I think what they are is they, they are a genuine option for us for a form of self-transcendence that we can render scientifically legitimate by understanding the way it optimizes the how of our cognitive meaning making. And the evolution of that meaning making? What, so I, I need a little bit more specific. I mean, I can talk about how sort of we evolved as a species and I can talk about the cultural evolution, like things like the axial revolution, and, and I understand that. And I do think 
uh, uh, part of what the series has tried to do is point out the deep connection between the invention of psychotechnologies and their internalization, and then that how that transforms uh, the how of cognition. Let me give you, a, 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 I think, a non-controversial example. So one of the things I would argue that drove, and many people would agree with this, this is not just my claim, that drove the, uh, the axial revolution of around 800 BC to 300 BC. This is when the great world religions are being invented, philosophy is being invented, Buddhism is being invented, all this is being invented, right? Carl Jaspers originally put his finger on this. Karen Armstrong has wrote a really good book on this called The Great Transformation. Anyways, one of the things that's going on especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, is the invention of alphabetic literacy, right? So before that, you have like ideogra like I have like ideograms tattooed on my arm, right? But you have ideographic, hieroglyph, you have all these very complex, and, and so being literate is a very demanding thing. In fact, your job in the ancient world is you could be a scribe, which means your only job is, and it's a good job, is you're literate, right? And so a small percentage of the population is literate. When you get alphabetic literacy, the, 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 the amount, the, some people I think have estimated it, it swells to around 20% of the population becomes literate, right? Now think about what that psychotechnology does to you, does for you, okay? You have deeply internalized it. It is so automatic to you, right? If I put a word up in front of you and say, look at this and don't read it, you won't be able to do it. Right? It's absolutely transparent. It's so internalized to your cognition. You probably think in sentences in your head. But think about what literacy does to your cognition. Okay? It, I can now store my thoughts external to me, and I can come back later and revise them. So I can connect previous instances of my brain to current instances. That massively increases right, the processing power. I can, I can link my processing to your processing. I can step back and look at it at length, rather than trying to hold it in working memory. All of this means I can massively self-correct my own cognition. So try and do this thought experiment with me. Think about all the problems you're solving day-to-day -day basis, all the information you're processing. Now I take literacy from you. Most of those problems are now insoluble by you. You can't, you can't do it. You can't process the information. You can't access the information. You can't hold the information. You can't distribute the information. That's what psychotechnologies do. And what happens is they get invented for practical purposes, but then they get internalized. They permeate the functionality of our cognition, and then they transform us. So people, because of things like alphabetic literacy, because of the increased power and the increased awareness of their own cognition, they got a much greater sense of how this meaning-making in their mind distorts reality. And that's what helps afford the whole axial revolution. So our cognition is, there's a cognitive cultural evolution to our cognition so that things we take to be natural are actually internalized via psychotechnologies from our culture. And, and, and of course, the internet and, and other things on our smartphones are also doing that. We are naturally born cyborgs. Our, our, our brains evolve to internalize these psychotechnologies and physical technologies. And the thing about the internet is it, th that's doing it in a huge ways we don't yet understand. Great place to, to end, John. Um, for everyone watching, really highly recommend John's series, Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. And I think you're going to do 50 episodes altogether. Yep. That's right. I'm not going to ask you how it ends now because uh, I don't want to give it away for anyone. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we've already filmed 28, and so the filming's ongoing, but we're, yeah, we're definitely committed to 50. Great. Real pleasure speaking to you, John. This was a, a, a great pleasure for me. Thank you very much. You're a great interlocutor.